College of Complexes. Oh, my, I'm at the wrong yeah. place. Yeah. <laughs> and we have with us our speaker tonight, uh, Kurt Johnson. And, uh, and he brought another Johnson along uh, to applaud. And uh, well, let's see. Uh, tonight, we should all be thankful that we at least got here. And it's warmer in here than outside. Uh, Probably would do a good job. Having heard all the our announcements, we are ready now to go hear from our professor, Kurt Anderson. Kurt Johnson. Kurt Johnson. Kurt Johnson. Yeah, yes, Kurt. All right. Here. I think it's quite good for you. Because I feel so bad. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was hoping to take I'm back. So good evening. Um, let's see. How do I sum it up in one sentence? What I'm going to argue tonight. You can't use our democracy to get anything but this. If you want to get out of that, you use these three laws, you take this into account, and you'll end up with that. Now, these are shaky. They're written in a shaky hand, and that's we'll call that because of their shaky status in the world. There's nobody recognizes these laws yet. You decide whether this is slanted left or right. <clears throat> So that's where we're going to go tonight. But before we do that, I I would like to go back to last meeting for just a minute. A couple things I'd like to to address. And the last time I spoke, I put up. I mean, I got. I made some references to the human brain. They're listed right here. I said, uh, we're born with an incomplete brain. The brain develops through exposure to a physical environment, and the physical brain matures during the late 20s. And I got quite a backlash on that. And uh, I was shocked. I didn't bring any, I did not bring any uh, evidence to back that up, because I did not know some of that was up for question, particularly the, when the brain matures. I did not know it was a, a challenge that the brain physically matures late. So I just wanted to bring some information in here tonight. I have, a, I have just a section from a book called The Human Frontal Lobes Function and Dis Disorders by Bruce L. Miller, M.D. and Jeffrey L. Cummings, M.D. And it reads, cortical gray matter, the frontal lobe, has a different growth pattern than white matter. Gray matter grows in an inverted U, pat U pattern rather than linearly. The front lobe reaches maximum thickness by adulthood that varies based on gender. Females reach peak frontal lobe thickness by 11, whereas males 12.1. In contrast, the temporal lobe, cortical gray matter, reaches maturity in females at 17.7 years and in males at 16 years. Motor and sensory areas of the brain mature in the first two years of life, and the frontal poles mature early. The, do the dorsal prefrontal frontal cortex is the last area of the frontal lobe to mature and is not fully developed until 10 years after puberty or 25 years of age. So that would be just item number one to bring up on that point. Item number two, and this is from, uh, this one came out of, uh, it's called Oh, psychology today. When is the brain fully mature? 
In a, recent, in a recent paper in the Journal of Neuroscience, investigators described a study in which they monitored white matter changes in 103 healthy human subjects aged 5 to 32 years. For each subject, they imaged the brain at least twice with an average period of four years between scans. Some tracts, such as sections of the corpus callosum, appeared to reach maturity during adolescence, but in about 50% of the older subjects, the association fiber tracts continue to mature. And these fiber tracts may be important for the performance of cognitive tasks. Does the development of these pathways vary with experience and training, and can these continue to grow? So it raises the question. And this is from, this is from physics.com. This is just an article posted on something else. Brain is not fully mature until 30s and 40s. New research from the UK shows the brain continues to develop after childhood and puberty and is not fully developed until people are well into their 30s and 40s. The findings contradict current theories that the brain matures much earlier. The last one I want to bring up on this point. This is an article by a uh, man named Mo Castandi, and it came out of his hope. He, he is a, a writer for The Guardian, and he wrote an article, and it was on bipedalism, and birth, and brain evolution. And he said, he, he described the process of brain evolution, but here's a, I'll just read a paragraph. In humans, the anterior fontanelle remains, remains open for the first few years of life allowing for the massive increase in brain size, which occurs largely during early life. The opening gets gradually smaller as new bone is laid down and is completely closed by about two years of age, at which time the frontal bones have fused to form a structure called the metopic suture. In chimpanzees and bonobos, by contrast, brain growth occurs mostly in the womb and the anterior fontanelle is closed at around the time of birth. So I raised that because it was argued that the, uh, there really wasn't a difference between us, but I would say that difference is the difference between a 10 key adding machine and a supercomputer. And there's a, that, you know, so I, I my point is, I think I'm very, I'm, I'm on solid ground when I make my points. And if I can't bring all the evidence to prove every little point, um, but I don't, I don't think it's speaking out of turn. Um, the last point I'd like to make, and it was brought up that someone asked me who my influences were, and I gave them the answer, no one. And that was kind of a, that, that kind of raised the stir. And it might have been you, but I can't remember. No, I asked you who, you who your references were for your language development, and had you read anything by Jim PSA or Right, and then, like and then I said no, and then you said, you know, who are your influences? And I answered your question with no one, which you came back and rebuttal and said, well, that's very arrogant, and, and you just mentioned Chomsky, and I heard you, and I agree. That the answer was well, given you, to you. Well, you wrong. actually mentioned Chomsky in your, yes. in your, in your, in your thing. But now, I didn't but, ask I, about your influences, I asked who you were using for references. <laughs> I heard it as who, who influenced my work, who's, who's work did I base my theories on, and I said no one, and you know, and, and I made my point. Now I'd like to say that that's not true, and I admit that, but I took your question in this context because you were asking me about sociological thinkers, and I said no one, because I base my theories on the work of well, let's see, who would, I, who would I start with? I would start with George Cayley. He was the man who invented flight. I would follow with Isaac Newton. He was the man who was the first one to conceive of the thing called gravity, which can't even be seen. There was Pascal, the mathematician, who did some really fine work in, in physics. Um, there is Pacioli, who actually invented the, uh, the he, he invented double entry accounting. But I'm an accountant by trade, so you know I admire his work. I think how do you ever come up and become the first person to ever figure out something like that? And um, Nikola Tesla, there's a guy who did a lot of thinking. And uh, Jonas Salk and Sabin together, there's some guys who solved a big problem that nobody can solve before them. 
And there was Edward Jenner. He was the one who actually set the stage for Sock and Saber to do their work because he's the one who solved the problem of smallpox. And then there was another one. His name is Edward Howell, and he's from the state of Illinois. And to give you a brief quote, run down on him in about 19, I can't remember if it was 9 or 19, 19 in the beginning of the century. He was a, a limited doctor in the state. He was working in a sanitarium and he became, was a, actually one of the first people to recognize that fresh fruits and vegetables were fundamental to human health. And he comes into play because back about 1860 or 1870, science had discovered the thing called the uh, enzyme that existed in food, and they had established that the enzyme was a negative thing because it caused food to rot. And so they came up with all these systems of how to kill these enzymes, thus preserving food. Edward Howe said, no, you need those enzymes. They are vital to human nutrition. And he went on a 50-year campaign to make that point. And he worked his whole life, and he, he gathered just volumes of information. And, but he could not get the scientific program, the scientific community, to acknowledge his work and accept the truth of it. So, today, it's pretty well established he was right on. His work is no longer questioned. But all the work that he did, he did. He compiled just hundreds of thousands of pages of evidence. It's all been reduced down to a little book you can buy in any store today on nutrition, enzyme nutrition. And, uh, but that's all he needed to say. But he wasn't accepted, so he went out, he spent his whole life trying to gather enough information to make his case. His work was carried on by another man named um, Howard Loomis, incidentally, who exists in, he lives in Missouri and Wisconsin, and he's a, he's a fantastic scientist, and he is one of my influences. I study the way he thinks to think this problem out. So that's my, you know, those are my influences. I Chomsky, I only cited him on his one scientific observation. I know his books, I've read a lot of them but I'm not going to cite him as an influence because he didn't teach me how to think and solve this problem. I don't refer to him or his solutions when I think this problem through. Okay. So... I need to, need to set you up here a little bit. We want to go to a big idea in one hour, one hour is a very little periods of time actually. In order to do this, I had actually created a tape that I was hoping could go on the, on the net and you could watch it and that would prepare you for this evening. I would talk about some basic ideas that would set us up so we could move through this. And it didn't, things didn't work out. Life goes on. But now we've got to figure out how to get everything through this hour. And I'm going to opt to make some claims, not defend them. But we'll move on as we'll go, go as we can, and then what we need to fill in during the question and answer, hopefully we can. And I hope the video, I understand the video's up now. It we is. We can actually go back later and watch this video, and we could maybe fill that in backwards. And I'm sorry it has to go that way, but uh, doing the best we can under the circumstances. Get some butter, honey, okay? So, the three ideas that I would have worked then, uh, just so you know, I would have described what a mental experiment is and maybe some of you do know it, but it's actually a mental experiment is the process they used to prove the quantum world, the nature of the quantum world, before they had a means of even seeing the quantum world. It was a device that's been used all through time, but uh, Einstein formalized it. And they used it to run experiments they couldn't actually physically run, and they got the right answers out of them. It's a fantastic process. Um, we can use it for anything, really. Um, I would discuss the difference between equilibrium and equality, because we've been working really hard for equality, and we need to get to equilibrium. Equality is a mathematical trait. Equilibrium is a trait that's really, it's a physics phenomenon. It's not equality, but it's a, it's, it's a different thing. And I probably won't go into it in a great detail here, but we need to be finding equilibrium rather than equality. But we'll get to that. And the last thing I would have done was to demonstrate why the equilibrium 
and how equilibrium works and how you have to apply the concepts of equilibrium is I broke down the game of football and showed you that football, the thing that makes it a successful system, and it is a successful social system when it's just taken in the context of the football game and not professional football, not children's football leagues, not high school football leagues, but the game of football is a successful social system and break it down and show you how it thrives because it's a system that's established in equilibrium, finishes in equilibrium, and, is main, and equilibrium is maintained throughout the game from beginning to end. We, just to make a point, when we said we started out with some really good rules here, and that was actually was a point of equilibrium, but we didn't stay with it. We broke equilibrium immediately, and we've never returned to equilibrium. But that's, uh, that would go there, and you can see that. And that would be the third, the, the third social model, non, the third non-social social model I think I've referred to. I've referred to the airplane, I've referred to the traffic systems, and I've referred to football. And so, you know, I'm, they're all running by the same rules, they're always displaying the same behaviors, and if you want to study it and learn the behaviors, then you begin to understand how we might get through here. So, flying through this, let me begin. I'm going to make a proposal tonight that I guarantee you're going to go all oh, bullshit. I guarantee you. Okay. But I ask you to think it two ways. There is, we can't do this from the standpoint of how will we ever make such a change in the first place, which is like how will you ever get the first airplane to fly, how will you ever get the first case of smallpox solved, how will you ever get the first man on the moon. And then there's a question of if you get over that mountain and you get to the other side of it, what exactly could be going on if you could get there? Choose how you want to look at it. I recommend if you want to really think about it, think about what the potential is just as a physical system. If it's physically possible, don't ask if it's politically possible or anything. Ask if it's physically possible based on what you know is simply physically possible. That's a hard thing to do. It's a, we, you know, it's a hard thing to say, if it's physically possible, we can try it. But you, are, you might not be aware of it. But every rule in the world that we operate by was created by human beings. So why don't we change the rules again? Why, what's going to stop us from changing the rules? Now, yes, there are some, some barriers. Let's not... Let's not diminish the barriers. But maybe let's think beyond the barriers and see if isn't there a possibility beyond the barrier. And then if we can see that, then maybe that gives us the gumption to go ahead and get over that barrier. Gives us some and you know I'm talking about something I, which would at what, the apex of experience? I'm going to talk about the, the election of the president, how we choose the president of the United States of America. Well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not um, silly. Uh, well, I may be, but uh, I, I'm not on any, on any delusion that we're going to do this at this level. We're actually going to have to find other ways to prove this system is valid and can be relied on before we ever got there. And we would actually have, you know, it's like anything else. You have to prove it at the small level before you prove it at the big level. So I'm not proposing, and, that we lead, I, and I'm not proposing to lead anybody's revolution. I, count me out. That's, that's not what I'm going to do. Revolution will never make a change in the world. It hasn't yet. All revolution is, and this goes to what the United States is, the, the, the United States has actually been, from its inception, tearing the world up. And that's how it's made its success. That's how it has torn the world up. Now, anybody, the easiest, easiest tool in the world to get a hold of is to tear something up. 
I can give any 16-year-old kid a sledgehammer, and he can tear hell out of any house I point him at, any car I point him at. I can give anyone in this room any tool to tear anything up. And anyone can tear my work up to the same ways that I can tear anything else up. What we don't know how to do is organize fine systems. We can tear hell out of them, and we've been tear tearing hell out of everything for 235 years and counting right now, and we're about to come to the end of that because there's not much more we can tear up. We've actually started to run out of things to tear up. And, and part of tearing up is being able to loot the system, but we're running out of things to loot. And it's fascinating because we've always thought that we could tear the world up beyond us, people could suffer the, rec the recriminations of it, and we wouldn't have to experience them. We could always make a profit off of those. And global warming is a beautiful thing in that sense because it, it has, it's just, uh, it provides a thing called equilibrium. It distributes the effects of our tearing the world up in a way that we can't control. And it's going to force us to go look at this. But if we don't know how to change the world, because we are a model dependent species, we cannot conceive what we can't see. And if we can't see the different way, we can't stop tearing the world up. It is the only way we know how to build a social order. What's a demonstration? It's trying to tear down a world. What's a war? It's trying to tear down a world. Everything we do is basically, we'll tear that down and we'll force those people to build something better. They can't because they don't know how. It's just a simple fact of physics. If people knew how, I'm very certain people would have started doing it a long time ago. But everybody can believe they know how, and then they can believe, you know, I know how to do it, but everybody else in this world doesn't know how to do it. They're, they're, they're evil, mean, and nasty, and that's why we get these problems. Nope, there are no evil, mean, and nasty people in this world. I'm going to give you a couple of, um, ideas that I have to think out of, and I invite you that you will have to think out of. And one is, we have to think of what a community is. Now, sociology has its definitions of community. I meant to bring them, to read them, but they're basically inadequate. Nobody's a, a community is basically a group of people doing what a, a community, a group does. But they don't define the difference between a successful community and an unsuccessful community because every group is doing something. And we need to see the difference between a successful community and an unsuccessful community. Successful communities organize by rule to cooperate in order to achieve collectively what no one in the community could achieve individually. And the thing that drives a successful community is mutual benefit. The, the breakdown is always in the area of mutual benefit. Let's stay on community for just a minute. Now, if you're going to think this problem through, I, I, I offer you, you have to think of an idea of our community. When you think of organizing the world, you have to say, how am I going to... Think if I want to solve this problem, I got to organize this world so it works for my community. Now you have to define your community. Sociology hasn't built a working definition of community that's valid, I don't think. But I'll tell you who has it: biologists, because they, this is how they built the, the schematic that shows all the interaction of all the dependencies and interdependencies and reliances and everything in the physical world, where species depend on each other. And the biologists, in order to get there, had to accept that everything in a physical environment is a part of the community. They, could, they had to accept everything in that physical environment is a part of the community. And they've done that again in the ecosystem. They have created the ecological community, and when they do that, they accept everything that's in the, bi in the biological world and everything else that, it, that that biological world is dependent upon in order to survive. I propose to you that you have to think if, there's a, that if you're going to build a set of rules that are going to organize a country or a government, 
wherever those rules reach in the geographic region, anybody in there has to be considered part of your community. And you have to be willing to defend their rights, you name them, whatever you like, this here. If you don't like those, create what else you want to defend. You have to be willing that everybody in that group gets this. And you have to think, how am I going to get everybody to get that? If you want to say, well, not everybody can have it, therefore, I can't do that, therefore, it's only getting, we're going to have to have some haves and have-nots, that's fine, we know how to do that. We can all be haves and have-nots right now. Most of us don't get much. A few of us get a whole damn lot. We can continue that. There's no law that says we can't. We can do this until we just trash the planet and trash us. It's, it's, nobody's going to stop us. Now let's play the game. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about how you would play if you wanted to set up a world so that you could create a government that would deliver this to everybody with no exception. Okay, it, I'm assuming that this is okay, that these are, these are goals that everybody agrees this is what we'd like. And we'll just jump right into it. The United States, because you have this language in the Declaration of Independence, was actually there, put there for a reason. It was put there because if you didn't have that language, you wouldn't have gotten the agreement out of the people you needed to get their agreement to wage that revolution. You had to say, those people who wrote that had to say, we're all in this together, we're all equals in this game together. If they hadn't, it wouldn't have happened. Every social system ever built began in a system of equilibrium. When they built the United Nations, they said, all equal, all in. You go to a church, they'll always say, we're all together in this, we're all equal, we may have a leader, but he's leading us all to the same place. He'll make, we will get the spiritual guidance that makes all of us Thanks. spiritually mature. That is, we always, we have to begin in equilibrium. We can't measure everything in equality. But we can measure in equilibrium. We'll do it by measuring equal. Now, what do I mean by that? Everybody has a different job. Everybody has different interests. Everybody's going to interpret those differently. But equality is the ability to pursue, have the experience of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, whatever that means to you. And if you've got that, and I've got that, and you've got that, we don't need to make those things, we don't need to even measure them equal. We can't measure them equal. But we will only get there by measuring the things equal that we can measure equally. So every system begins in equilibrium. And I'll be bring you one more piece of evidence that this system began in equilibrium. And that is because there were three rules. They're written in the United States Constitution and only three rules of what was required to be president of the United States of America. They are, you had to be 35 years of age, you had to be a natural born citizen of the United States, and you had to be resident of the United States. 10 years. Uh, brain, pardon? 10 years. Thank you. Oh, my brain is going to slip on that one. Those three qualifications, and you're qualified to run for president of the United States. Now, every rule that has come down after that has been a rule instituted for the purpose of denying people the opportunity to exercise that right to be president of the United States if they held those qualifications. Those rules began to be broken by the very first people who had the right to change the rules, who were the people who made them and said, we will enter into this contract with you, but then they started changing the contract 
by their ability to change the nature of the government. They won. So, I propose to you, if you ever want to solve this problem, and you want to really have a government, you start right there. You say, we'll knock out every qualification except those. Because there's no, there's very little bigotry in those. There's actually a little bit of bigotry in one of them. That's when you have to be a uh, natural born citizen. But there's no bigotry in there. And it couldn't be if you wanted to work. But then you build in the bigotry after the fact. But anybody in this room qualifies. And there's no bigotry in 35 because assuming natural lifespans, everybody has the uh, basically the equal number of opportunities after they reach 35 to be president as anybody else. So, <clears throat> let's talk about these rules for a minute before we go on with this. Design, and it, design exists in advance of an independent of organization execution of design. That's the first law of social organization. This law was written in in advance of the formation of the government. This structure was written in. That's designed in advance of and independent of the organization and execution of the design. This is, these are the things that were written in before the system was put together and operated. It's the failure to stick to that that causes the failure in the country. And that's the violation of the first principle, not to live with your design. There's ways to get around that. You can make changes. And you have to be able to make changes because the social worlds particularly change. Well, let's go on. How are we going to figure out? We got, and I'm guessing that if we said, okay, if we scratch it tomorrow, we would have. Oh, well, let's say, we said, we're going to go back, and this is the rule. If you meet those three qualifications, you can run for president. I bet we'd have um, 125 million people want to be president. Seriously. Because, well, it's a pretty cool job. It's a pretty neat job. It pays well, and uh, it's pretty, it's got a lot of status to it, and you get a lot of, but, so that makes it, that brings up an interesting question. How are you going to decide who gets to be? We're not done, are we? No. Oh, good. <clears throat> who gets to join? Well, <clears throat> opportunity is awarded on the basis of self-selection. Anybody who meets those criteria has the right to choose to run for president. Sir, think about it. That's how you run it. If you got a rule, anybody, opportunities word on self-selection. Anybody who's qualified gets to choose to run. Okay. I propose to you this is how you do it. I'll give you an idea. We'll just think about this. I can make up any rule I want because I'm building a system. As long as it's a physical system. As long as it can be physically done, in this middle experiment, I get to make up the system. Here's the rule. If you meet those qualifications and you want to run for president, I want you to write your name, address and phone number, and social security number on a postcard, and I want you to mail it to a stated address. There's your qualifications. That's your president. Everybody who wants to be president, you just mail that card in. We're going to get those cards all collected. We can do this. And we're going to run what is called a chaotic process. Because potential conflicts in self-selection are resolved by chaotic process. We're not going to fight it out. We're not going to duke it out. We're not going to like get into some pissing contest. We're going to solve it this way. We're going to have a chaotic process. What is a chaotic process? A chaotic process is one of the, it's a, it's a grand phenomenon that exists in all of nature. And that's where you, systems run. Nobody controls them. They always drive to a predictable outcome. But the amazing thing about the outcome is you cannot predict the specific nature of that outcome until it actually occurs. 
One of those things is like, think about it now. A chaotic process is when the skies are moving and the weather moves and you always know you're going to get rain and you predict we're going to get an inch, but you actually don't know how much you're going to get. And you can get an, you can get an inch and a quarter over here and a quarter mile away. You can get half an inch or maybe even a mile away. You get nothing. That's a chaotic process. You can't predict the outcome until the outcome has already occurred. Well, we can run a random process which no human being can actually control. No human being can actually control, even though human beings will have to organize and execute the process, but no single human being can organize and control. No one has control over who's president. You pull that card out of the hat, that's your president of the United States. Now, I want to show you something. <clears throat> I just eliminated voter fraud, something nobody can. I just solved the problem of lack of access to the ballot, where like people say they can't get on the ballot because they have good ideas. Sure, you were in just as much as everybody else. I just solved the, solved the problem of partial poll monitors. Those people who stand at polls and ask certain people for IDs and prevent them from coming in and voting and raising challenges and making them cast provisionals that don't get count counted and all that crap. I just saw, you see that? Think about this. How many people bought ads? Like, how many people like you bought ads to bring up and, and tell us what a scoundrel this guy was and how much better you are? They're gone. I eliminated them. Physically. It was a physical problem solved. All these problems that everybody says you can't solve because they are structures of human nature. No, they're not. They're structures of physics that occur because of the nature of human beings and the design of the system we put them in. You can get rid of all these problems if you think about what you're doing. Now let's go back here and think about this dear president. You have your choice. Do you want this or do you want this? You can't have you you, you can't have the system that gives you this and never get that. You really have to think about it. Because you can't run the system you've got today and not get those. But in that process, as weird as it is, I just eliminated the problem of bigotry. I have just eliminated discrimination in this country. You're a woman, you have whatever, whatever, 51% chance men only have a 49% chance. If you're black, you have about 10, 11%. If you're Hispanic, I don't know what the number is today. If you're over uh, 50, you have a much larger chance than the ones under, under 50 at this point. If you're working class, you have a much bigger chance of getting there than if you're wealthy. Now, this sounds like an extremely chaotic and scary process, doesn't it? So don't think about it, what would happen if we did it tomorrow, because we're not going to do it tomorrow. But think about what happens when the world works later on. Because let's move to the same process of choosing the vice president. Because now we have a rule that says the president gets to choose the vice president. And actually what we always end up with is an alliance of two people plus, we'll get there, against the people of the United States who are plotting, sorry, it's true, they're plotting to further their own self-interest because they are self-willed and self-interested human beings. They will always do this. They will serve, use the office and the power to further their own self-interest. So, we return to the same rule. You're, you're welcome to have a vice president, you probably need one, Design exists in advance. We're going to set it up. Opportunity is awarded on the basis of self-selection. Anybody want the job? Sign up. We'll run the chaotic process again. We'll find out who your vice president is. Now, we can do that by the same thing. We don't even have, uh, I don't even think there's a qualification of that being an American citizen for vice president. You, uh, you, because you serve at the pleasure of the president and for the privilege of the president. But think, think about this. How about the cabinet? Now, we don't have to run everything the same way. But if you have to set the rules up, and I could, you could let anybody do this. 
if you were setting the rules up and you needed a vice, uh, a, a cabinet member, uh, secretary of health, education, and welfare. Today, all he has to be is somebody the president likes because, well, the president likes him. Run this process. All of a sudden, you'll be asking people that people will decide, I guarantee you, before we get that person in there, we want to know that they're qualified to do this job. What specific characteristics are we going to put on them? Do we want to work in a lifetime in education before they become the Secretary of Education? Fair enough. If we want them to be there, we'll let them have that qualification. If these qualifications must simply be physically verifiable, they cannot be the opinion of anybody. They have to be physically verifiable that you and I and you and I, we can all look at that person and agree that they meet that characteristic. You want to say they have to have 10 years in, in the classroom, 7 years as a, as a school administrator, and another 10 years as a system administrator before you want them in that job? Cool. I'm agreed. Let's put it in there. I like it a lot better than having somebody who serves at the will of the president. Now, that's got, you're creating government of the people, by the people, for the people. Right there, it has to look like that. Just think about it. You create a chaotic system that nobody controls. But I'm going to ask you, if you set that person in there, and I don't care who you set in, that stranger, is it more likely that the people in government that he does not choose, are going to hold that president to the conduct that we expect of presidents? If you had done this in 2000, um, was that one, two, or three, when George Bush got everybody to agree that we need to invade Baghdad? If George Bush had just by chance gotten to be the president by himself and everybody in that room was not serving at the, at the pleasure of the president, but was actually serving at the pleasure of the people of the United States, do you really think they would have all agreed that we needed to invade Baghdad? You've got the checks and balances that you want all over the place. Now, carry this out. You start choosing. Think about this. You've just eliminated legacy government. You have just eliminated the Bush legacy, the Kennedy legacy, the Adams legacy, any of those legacies. You've eliminated them. They're not there anymore. Every time you run an election, everybody has an equal chance to go. The guy who was president, he can throw his hat in, hat in the hat, ring. But he doesn't get to get, he has no privilege and no advantage for being president. It starts over, and that's the nature of equilibrium. Every time you start things over, all the time, and equality, equality, equality. My system gives everyone an equal opportunity to be president. Think of that. That's what we claim this country is about. I just delivered what this country is about by the play of these three laws. That's the reason it will work if you, if, just to tell you, those laws run the universe. They run social systems in the universe. They're not a joke. I didn't make them up. I didn't do this and then fit these laws to it. I found the laws, I studied them, I set this up. Now, you think everybody's got to be super bright? Okay. No one person in this country theoretically does anything. We're, it is a cooperative effort. It's a collective effort. Don't you think if you put a real numbskull in, that it'd be just like we've had when I've, we've had our real numbskulls? The people of the United States actually did their work and held the thing together while these numbskulls were playing their games? You had, believe it or not, 40-some presidents that have failed to carry that out. Who could do worse? Who could do worse than we've done? Think about this. If you run this system down through the Senate, if you run it through the House of Representatives, do you really think 
for this white majority, this 95% white male majority, do you think it survives? How? If the universe makes it survive, I'd be a big joke. But now you've got 51% women, 49% men, you got 10%, 17% black, whatever the numbers are. You got the Hispanics, you got the, the, the Chinese, you got the poor people, you got the people who've been cut out of education already. They are in the Senate, and they are in the House of Representatives. Now, when you get ready to go make laws, since none of these people got their job by getting money from these people, the lobbyists, who's their loyalty going to be to? Particularly, wait a minute, we'll stand over here. I'll put it over here for a minute. If none of these people that are in office get their money from a lobbyist, exactly who do you think they're going to vote for when they go to vote on an issue? If, think of this, if they've got two years basically in office, when they're done, the odds are thousands to one that they will have that job back. They have to run to their community and they have to go back to where they live or they have to get another job. They can't be a career politician. Whose interest do you think they're going to act in? They're going to act in their own personal best interest. You're going to let the law of self they're going to let their self-interest work. Why? Because it's going to be your self-interest. Why? Because they won't be able to set themselves up in a privileged position relative to you. They're going to have to make the world safe when it's a world that they don't no longer control. If they make it safe for them and they can't control the world, they make it safe for you. I know it sounds outlandish because you think about the dynamics. You have one crack to change a law. You have one crack to make the world different than you found it. When you get done, you have to go back and be a normal person in that world and accept the repercussions of what you've done. Do you really think you're going to write whoever comes after you a really cushy, privileged job and get yourself squat? No, you won't. You'll act in your own best interest. And by doing that, you'll work and act in everybody else's best interest at the same time. You'll be dealing with issues. You will no longer have anything of this. You will no longer have any hidden issues in the world. You want to know how many unemployed people are in this country? Run this process. That the approximate percentage will show up in the House of Representatives and the Senate. Then we'll say, well, they're lazy and they're no count. And they don't. And they'll just stand up and they'll say, you know, you want to talk about that? You change the language so fast. And you, of course we'd be afraid of it. But wait a minute. You think you do, you think you're afraid of that? How many of you choose the banker, the bank teller that you go see to take care of you and do your your transaction as you've asked her to and by the rules? How many of you choose the airline pilot you fly by? How many of you choose? The guy who drives the bus. How many of you choose the person who cooks your meal when you go to the restaurant? You are using all the people in the world who are serving you. Do you really, is it that, is it that important for you to choose these people or is it more important for you to choose a system that says Anybody can be. Think about how complex rules would be after that. Do you think you would really have a 13,000 page law that nobody's actually read that is crap, packed with crap that nobody understands? Or do you think law would get very simplistic? The world does not have to collapse. The world could get very interesting.
It's all done by a process. Design a system, and here's one of the things. If you want to change the system, let's make a rule. Because I can make all the rules I want when I design a system. And when I have to test it and see if it works. Let's make a rule. If you are the President of the United States, and you decide you want to, want to exercise different rules than you've been living under because you're, you're cramped, we'll make a simple rule. We'll let you institute the change on your way out of office. So, when you get ready to leave, you're going to come tell us that this is a very important rule. And I want to change it. Now we can have a decision. If we accept it, you're gone. Somebody you don't even know gets to live, be president with that rule. I just changed the dynamics incredibly. You can't change the rules and take advantage of them. You have to change the rules and let somebody else take advantage of them. Very sweet. If, you, if the rule is so important you have to change it today, resign. We'll just have a test. If it's so important that you've got to change it, your self-will and your self-interest will make you resign so you can implement this rule to solve your problems. Now we could go through all the mechanics of this. I could do this, I can show you exactly how you set the mechanics of a chaotic process up that nobody controls, nobody controls the outcome of. And that means that if you have 135, people, 000, 135 million people who want to be president until that name is pulled out of the hat or the box or how you get to that process, the odds are 135 million to one that any person in the, in the United States who wanted the job gets the job. When you do that, you have a process that can't be cor corrupted. You have just solved the problem of empty debates. You know these things you guys, some people get all excited about and pretend something actually happened that when actually it was just a bunch of smoke screen? They're gone. How about the election process that, that 2016, I understand, has already started because Jeb Bush is uh, out there hunting and fishing. So it's going to be a four-year election process. I saw that it's a one-day election process. Oh, I know. President, representatives, senators, they work for 364 days in their last year in office. They get one day where they don't work. And it cost them, everybody in the country, it cost everyone 50 cents to make that application. Fine. It sounds very fair to me, equal. If you don't have 50 cents, well, I guess that is a problem. But we can solve that. You can find that levels out, too. Your lies are gone. Your opponent bashing is gone. All that crap is gone. Everything on here. You can solve for lobbyists forever. All you have to make a rule is that if you're a representative, I get to make this rule too. If you're a representative, you can't tell me what the hell to do or what I'm going to do for me. You have to listen to me and you have to listen to the people in your constituency. So we're going to not let you run to Washington and keep your own calendar. We're going to have you sitting at a desk just like you're a bank teller, just like you're a grocery clerk, just like you are anybody else in this world. And when your constituents need to talk to you, they have to come see you. And if we have too many of them at one time, we'll run a chaotic process. We'll decide who gets in when. And if you want to be a lobbyist and you want to run around the country and you want to go to every town that has a representative in it and you want to stand in line, fine. I bet you don't do it anymore. It won't be in your self-interest. You won't be able to accomplish anything. You can't control the world. Now you're beginning to get results. That's my case. I can do it bigger. I don't have a long period of time. Go through everything you got, over and over. Everybody wants to be able to control the world, decide who's good and bad. I don't care. I don't care. You give me, you give me an election of two million, two, 200, 250 million people, 320 million, where anybody can be president, anybody gets to be president, and we settle it without a fight. We settle it by a process that nobody controls. I'll take them. I won't be afraid of them. I won't worry about them. If I did this tomorrow, 
I guarantee you, if we could do this tomorrow, I guarantee you, the next day, Dick Cheney would be on TV, if he could still get there, arguing that this unitary presidency that he was so fond of, bad idea. Presidents need to really be monitored. Presidents need to be, their feet held to the fire. He would change his political tune, but so would everyone else. Everyone else would be saying, we got to have rules and we got to live by rules. But because people would only have two and four years and they can't control their predecessor, their, their, their successor. They're going to be just like everybody else. They're not going to want to face the shame of it being discovered they were embezzling. They'll do their job honestly. Because they won't be able to control how they, what their work is after they leave. And that's how... If you, and this is not a strange idea because if you understand accounting and you understand auditing, the way you keep a company safe is, the way you keep the company's assets safe is, you don't let anybody control, you don't let anyone have exclusive control, you mix people up, and you never let anyone do their own ver verification of their work. It's when you let someone actually verify their own work, you get fraud. <laughs> when you let somebody attest to their own goodwill, you get fraud. But if they can't attest to it, you don't get it. Because it's really hard. Collusion is a hard thing if you keep mixing people up because it takes a long time to establish a relationship that you can trust each other sufficiently to pull off a scam. <laughs> but if you've been running in the well, same political pro process for 15, 20 years and you know and you're going to be there, you, there's no difference between a Democrat and a Republican. It's all showboating. But in the end, it's the same thing. If you, you know, I haven't seen a change of direction in the government. So, I can go through the details. But think about what happens. You can't control it. The thing you want is what you don't have to control in order to be safe. There are so many ways to do that. I rest my case. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Charles Frank Sweat has the first question, and Francisco Aguilar the second. You know, I brought up that uh, point about the president had to be born in the United States, but isn't it, how would this have worked in the first four or five presidents? Because technically, it wasn't a country yet, or they wouldn't have been born here. So how, when did that rule change? I can't answer that, because I was thinking of that tonight. But I think it was... I believe, well, the Constitution is not, 1776, the country, as I said, the Constitution is written in 1787. So, when it was written, it's pro those are the, that's the original structure of the Constitution. That's the original, so that would have been when it was. So the first few years, and that was, if you go back and study your history, there was the Revolution, and then I believe it was the... If I have it right, it was the Maine farmers and the Vermont farmers and the Massachusetts farmers who said, this is a crock of shit because you just bought us the same kind of government that you gave us. So they said, we're not going for this. And the basically that, well, an uprising to go to equality will be equal. Okay. We're all in this together. All right. Use the mic, please. Yes. Okay. Sorry. No problem. So you want me to use the mic? Yes. Oh. You have to tell me what world do you live in? <laughs> how, 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 you telling in front of all of us that you are going to tell the senator or the president that he has to abide by your idea of what is good for the rest. I just proposed you some rules. What, what you can accept them or not. I didn't say I was going to tell them. You didn't say anything. Oh. You, I am waiting for your fucking rules. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think I did. Are. I think I did. I said we're going to elect you, you, you by this process. What That's... process? No pro what, what process? Now you have the power to force them. 
Send the postcard. Yeah, send them send the, the postcard, postcard that's drawn out of a hat. That's the process. What, yeah, what's, what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that? Uh, uh, what, what is the power that you have right. to make people change? <laughs> you didn't come with a system that you make you force anybody to do anything. I, I didn't offer to force anybody to do anything. So how, how do you make them do it then? What, what are you talking about? You're talking nonsense. <laughs> what? Keep talking and talking and saying nothing. Well, okay. I think well, he okay. makes perfect yeah. sense for right. your speech, right? <laughs> All right, I, let's see. F. Okay. Let's see. Okay. I recognize somebody else. You, you recognize Frank, and then there probably was somebody back here. If somebody had a question. Get anybody. All right. I'm tired. Okay. I know. Well, get the. <laughs> Questions. Uh, first of all, what, uh, you are a professor uh, of what? No, I, no, I, I work this problem. I'm not a professor of anything. He calls me a professor, but he's misleading. Okay, please don't mislead. Um, now, why do you think that um, it, there is an equivalency of physics and human behavior? I mean, uh, it, it would be wonderful if it would be. It would be much easier to live. Um, where did you take that? Um, did you read really all sociology to claim that, uh, to put down sociology and um, take from them the explanation of how communities do work or don't, those that are successful or not, I doubt it. Um, and why do you assume that individuals are different or are separate than systems. Uh, aren't we uh, observing the world, seeing that we create systems, we mend the systems, we manipulate the system, we benefit from them, and we are the systems? That's a lot of questions, but I'll try to go backwards from the beginning. Yes, we are. We are a group of, we are as a group of people. We are constantly creating systems. We want to benefit from those systems. And every system we make, one of the tra traits of it is a few benefit, and many don't benefit. There are no exceptions to our systems that do that. We have to get beyond that. We have to figure out how to build a system that we build collectively that benefits us collectively. Okay, so that's the first question, the first thing. Now, we... That was communism. Did communism worked? No. So how? Probably which, right. which, which, which communism are we talking about? I'm, I'm not sure what the question I'm trying to figure out. No, I said communism was a system that was built like that, but it failed because people abused it and uh, um, twisted it and oppressed other people. Communism? It was built on equality, but it became about control. Communism suffers the same thing that our government does. It, it's no different. Communism was never a government of the people, by the people, for the people. God, it was supposed to be something like that. They were going to overthrow the proletariat, but then those who overthrew the proletariat became the proletariat and imposed their wills on the people. So you had a class from the, you never made the difference. And that's the problem you always end up with. The class that, try, threat, that promises to overrun and make people free actually take overruns and then uses the opportunity to make themselves the, the rulers and impose their will on the rest of the people, time and time and time again. That's your problem. Yes. Charles? Uh, Kurt, I... I got problems with your three laws, but I'll just pick on one to start. <laughs> now, opportunity is awarded on the basis of self-selection. That's right. But no, opportunity is tied into natural selection, not self-selection. You can't have, you can't choose to be whatever you want in any any grouping. It it's awarded. That's, a it's an eternal That's a choice. Wait a minute. Self-selection and awarded is an eternal... You can't write a law that is an eternal contradiction. All right. You can't award a self-selection. How do you... Either it's awarded 
Meaning, this guy awards it, or do I self-select? What kind of law is this? And it's opportunity if you ask for society, it, if you ask is for not it, awarded? I'm sorry? Or is it opportunities are awarded, or are they self-selected? And, well, and they're natural exactly. selection they're, that goes on in a society. Well, I'm not sure natural selection... Are you saying we're not humans? <laughs> well, I didn't say we're not human. No. Then there's we're no natural human. selection? Operative? Well, I'm not, you'd have to define what you mean by natural selection, but if you, yeah, mean, if you mean survival of the fittest... I'm stupid. <laughs> if you mean survival of the fittest, I don't agree that that's a valid law that even exists in the universe. That doesn't. Now I know that's going to go against everything that everybody says about Darwinism. I cannot be whatever I want to be. You cannot. No, I'm. It sorry. doesn't say you're going to be whatever I you want to be. I can't be a fullback for football. No, you can't. <laughs> but that's a physical yeah, limitation. That's not a societal limitation. Self-selection opportunities based on self-selection. And I can't, so my Fine. selections are very limited. Okay. And that limits my opportunities. And what kind of law is that then? Fine. <laughs> okay. Law of limited that's opportunities. Your yeah. I, I don't think this, I can't, well, I can't argue with it. We're not right trying to nail it down. Another questioner. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Margaret already. Margaret, I had her yeah, hand I, up. I'd like to go back to a chaos. question that Ayala had, the first part of her question where she said, how can you make the assumption that physical laws are the same as social laws? Oh, because I, you define a society, you define a social, let's, let's start here, let's define a social organization as a population that organizes together to achieve what no member of that population can achieve of itself. Okay? Okay, let's go. That's because that's that's what that's what social systems are. Every time people get together, they get together to create a benefit that none of them can create alone. If you create a buck hard club, that's what you're doing. If you're building a bowling alley, that's what you're doing. If you're putting up a bridge, that's what you're doing. You're organizing to cooperate, to create something that none of you by yourselves could achieve. Okay, the, the game is one of presumed mutual benefit. Okay, so... And what does it have to do with, with actual physics? physics? or physical laws. Because that's the way the universe is constructed. <laughs> but that's you have to explain it. That has, you the, have to explain it, what you that's mean That's the by behavior. That. That's what you will find in the 95 elements that make up the atom world. Oh, come on. What a bullshit. <laughs> what a fucking bullshit. <laughs> Do they not organize to create what none of them could have... That's you talking nonsense. All right. <laughs> My questions to you are twofold. First, what makes Char Darwin wrong and you right? That's number one. And number two, assuming that you were to get an audience with President Obama and with Speaker Boehner to explain your ideas, why wouldn't they just laugh you out of the office? Uh, the last second one, they would lock me out of the office because it would not be in their best interest to even acknowledge my idea had any validity. I don't make any pretense about that. They wouldn't give me an audience. I'm safe on that point. Nobody's going to invite me up to solve the problems of the United States. We don't have to deal with that. I'm Darwin. We could go through the mechanics of it. There is no doubt there is a thing called evolution where the parts of one species end up in the, in the system of another species. And the parts of that species end up in another system of species, and so on. The big question is, how did that process happen? Now, it's assumed, based on what Darwin said, that it's an unmanaged, uncontrolled process. 
That process, if you actually were to break it down and study it, against every known way that systems build, every system we have ever built, every system that we can study and we know how it was built, proves to have been organized by that first law. It was designed, it was organized, it was designed, and then it was put into motion. No system behaves the way Darwin's is supposed to behave. Now, there's two ways to go about that. You can believe Darwin, but you can't prove it happened. Because one of the ways we prove any law of physics or any phenomenon in the physical world is we are able to take that and adopt that law and cause things to be, behave as a result of managing that phenomenon. And we cannot cause a system to evolve into a more of its own. No system evolves. We cannot set a system up, put it to run, and watch it evolve into a more complex system. It has never happened. Now, let me finish one more thing here on Darwin. Darwin's an interesting character because Darwin was a minister and training. And I think if you go back and read the fifth chapter of Genesis, you will find the answer that Darwin gave us of how evolution occurs. It wasn't an idea he came up with. I'm going to argue to you that because you can only conceive what you can see. You can only see what you can conceive. He couldn't conceive anything. He had to fall back on what he had been taught. He interpreted it a little differently. But it says there that, you know, there would be this, this struggle, that life would be a struggle, and you know, there would be enmity between all the species. Then, man, it's all there. It's just an interpretation. And, you know, it's just this limitation, but he couldn't see what caused it. He created an explanation. That's the way it goes. Okay. Um, Peter's had his hand up for a long time. Okay. So, uh, how long did it take you to uh, come up with your system? About 25 years. Hey. Uh, you know, I keep looking at your system, and I keep thinking back to Adam Smith of 1776 and a book called The Wealth of Nations, and I keep looking at some of the other fundamental premises of capitalism, and I see a lot of the same tenets can you comment? It just seems like you're reinventing the capitalist system in a sense. Capitalism is a system written like this one. Capitalism is a system, the only way it works is if you have the gun. The gun is the unspoken part of the rules of capitalism. Just like the gun is the unspoken part of this. And this. Whoever has the gun controls the system. And it's always easy to say, well, people will, you can write an economic theory and say, as we did in, uh, in, in South and Central America, it was called the neoliberal polit uh, economics, where you go down and build factories and people would work those factories and that would give them work and they would produce and they would work at these late wages and that would produce wealth for the United States. And then, but nobody ever mentions in that theory that what made that work was a certain school in Georgia that teaches people how to put guns to other people's heads and make them go into those factories and work. And behind every good capitalistic system is a gun. <laughs> it's just a fact of the matter. It's worth three bucks. I've been enlightened. <laughs> Mark. You have silenced all our questions. Oh, I, I got one. Let's go. We need to comments. Charles. Okay, uh, you're uh, law number three there, Kurt. Now, we got a lawyer here. Do you, do you think we should have a con conflict resolution process that is chaotic? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it when called people a... want conflicts, they want justice. They don't want chaos. You no. want it you want it just the opposite. 
I, well, if I deal in arbitrations, I don't want it to be chaotic. I, I it's got to be orderly and due process. Actually, I'll bet if you were dealing in, in it's uh, called due process, not chaotic process, due process. Well, let's put it this way: if you are a corporation and you can't control the legal process. And if you want to put people in a position where you can beat them, as you can now, simply by throwing your cash at problems and none of them can individually master, each one of them has to cave to you because none of them is strong enough. But if you have a chaotic process no one can, can, can conceive the out, predict the outcome of, or control the outcome of, do you really think people would risk their money throwing into that system, or do you think they would actually work to avoid getting caught up in that system? I'm not talking about the little people now, the little individuals that massive corporations pick on, the corporations where they actually go into a system they could not control the outcome of. You want a system they can't control the outcome of, the only way to get it is have a system no one can control the outcome of. Up. Do you have a social organization without the rule of law? No, that's the beauty of it. You the have beauty? laws. No, you can't have a system without laws. But, the system, but all successful systems work by physical laws. No, you build a system of laws. When I said, you would say, anyone who wants to be president would sign up and just send their card in, that's a law, that's a rule. We can accept that. We can collectively agree to that if we want to. We don't have to. Well, we can't. If we do, it becomes the law. If we say we're going to pull it, we're going to run this chaotic process, which nobody controls, and that's who's president. That's your new law. That's the, that's the end game. That's that's all there is to it. If we agree, those are the rules. Those are the rules. Those rules, by the way, are exactly like the rules on the street. Those rules have the characteristic that if you look, think of the street laws. There are no street laws. I mean, there may be one once in a while that you actually aren't aware of, but by and large, you know every street rule. You know exactly what it takes to violate that rule. You know exactly what it takes to comply with that rule. You don't have that situation in our country in any level where, uh, 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 where you have problems. And that's the thing, because you cannot tell the law, and you can, no, one can no one can even comply by the law. No you need a simple law, but it has to, and the way you make simple law is for every law you make, there's a physical structure that goes with it to verify that law. Yes, Peter. So uh, are you looking for more better uh, representative democracy? Yeah, if you get, if you get, no. let's put it this way. Obviously, if you've got a country of 230, 320 million people, you can't have everybody get in a big room. You're going to have to winnow down to a group of people who can come to a decision. What you want is a group that actually represents the people they come from. This process will get you that group. Now, they can go in there. They can have their vote if they must. But you're going to find them, if you put them in this process, you don't, you don't have, who's going to arm twist in that process? Who's going to say, Boy, if you want my vote, you get my vote. Not if you set it up right, they can't do it. Who's going to say you have to vote? What, where would the parties go? They would disappear. Party politics would simply disappear because why would you join a party if all you have to do to be president or representative is fill out a, a, a postcard? It's gone. Now, what are you doing when you get there? You come in on your own. Aren't you going to vote your conscience? Isn't that what you want? And does it really matter? If you're a gay person, you want gay representation in a national government doesn't really matter if the person from your district is gay, if across the country you actually pop the population that is representatively gay and acting on your interest at a national level? <clears throat> Uh, can you uh, like take a minute or something, 60 seconds, and actually describe the process in which a, a, a president will be selected? How do you envision that working in a country of 300 million people? Okay. We, we have the capacity. We could do that. We could say, if you, want, if you want to be president, you send in your postcard. 
They all go to some central sorting session? Go to a central sorting session. Yeah. At that session, yes. We have a post office that processes that much mail every day anyway, so they can get that mail over to that central processing station. Okay. I've got $6 billion to spend. That's what we spent on the last election. If I can do this in less than a billion dollars, I think I've done a much better job. So I'm going to say that I can actually have a staff making what I'm going to call the community wage, which I'll call 75 grand, not, not minimum wage, I'm going to call 75 grand, and I can have them process every one of those cards and put them in a database. And we'll verify that there's one card from each person and nobody's loading the deck. Okay, we can do that, and you can actually calculate the cost of that. And I think you could do it for under $100 million. So you get all these cards in a database. Yeah, now we're going to take those cards. The database is just there for record keeping. We're going to take those cards, we're going to actually put them on pallets, on tr and we're going to wrap those pallets in shrink wrap, and we're going to put them on trucks. And I calculated that if you had 150 million of those, you would actually have 12 semi-trucks full of these cards. And you're literally going to go through a process where you go and you hold a public election you put them in an arena. Anybody who wants to come can come to that process. You have an, a, an arena. Call it Wrigley Field if you want. Okay? Now, the first thing that you, if the process is nailed down from the beginning. Everybody knows exactly what's going to happen. But how it's going to happen isn't chosen. And this is how you do it. You go out and you just pull a random eighth number of any section in there of 100 people. You know, section A on the first tier. Whatever. I don't know how they number them. Section A1, whatever it is. You bring that 100 people down. They're going to carry out the process from then on. You're going to put each one of them gets a number. Now, they pull them. You run a random selection. You pull a ball out of a barrel. Whoever gets it, they're looking at 12 trucks. And they have to take a number and they have to assign each of those trucks. Then they're done. They throw their number back in. They pull another number. Whoever gets that signs a letter to that truck. Out of that, you have 12 times 12 is 144 possibilities. Like a giant lottery. Like a giant lottery. And you're going to go, you're going to take those 144 possibilities, you're going to have a third person chosen at random who goes over there and reaches in there and pulls out one ball until he finds one of the 12 that's on the table. Until he finds uh, J7. Because that's the combination that pulled up both ends. Now, you keep doing that. You're down to one truck. You if you with the pallet, you do the same thing with the pallet. You're down to one pallet. You break the pallet apart. You work it down until you got basically 100 cards left. You throw them in a barrel. You pull. I say you pull 25. Why do you pull 25? In case the first person actually wasn't qualified because it was some 12-year-old kid who got through the system or he's dead or whatever. But the first person, you randomly, you randomly pull them and you pull them a second time again randomly and then you know who's your president. That's it. Random selection nobody controls. But everybody participates in it. Tedious, it's one day process. It's one day process. It costs you less than a billion bucks to do. Why wouldn't you do it? You save so much money. Okay, so, so uh, to continue the process of choosing a president, uh, do you agree that in spite of in spite of equal opportunity, uh, people are not born blank slate? Um, oh my, blank slate. <clears throat> okay, you know what, let me continue with that. Here is where I'm going with it. Okay. Um, so, if, um, let's say there was the same lottery system to choosing, say, a surgeon, okay? Oh. And people threw in their, you know, their, their, postcards with their names and there were trucks and all that and the one that got to be your surgeon has Parkinson <laughs> or some other nervous disease. Uh, is that a system, here is where I'm going, um, a system like that will cheat humanity from the merit, from qualification, from interest, wouldn't it? Um, 
Let me answer your question. First, I think you're mixing apples and oranges. I do. Here's why I think you're mixing apples and oranges. <laughs> In the first case, over here, I've only gone with the three rules that were set up. Those actually have to be the rules because it's government of the people, by the people, for the people. Yeah. Okay, now, let's talk about being a surgeon. I don't know if you ever aspired to be a surgeon. How would it look if, because the only way you have to run a system to make it fair is you have to have bars that are measurable. And if you pass the bar, you're accepted. So let's say we've got a school. You want to be a surgeon. You have the skill to do it. The, the, the mental skills to do it. You don't have the physical skills. I don't want you operating on me until you have those physical skills. Mm -hmm. but, the right. But there's nothing wrong with saying that in order to be a surgeon, you have to go to medical school, you have to have your six-year residency, and you have to demonstrate your competency through a court. However, it's the difference that we're talking about is how we get to the point that we choose who becomes the surgeon, because we have a very biased system that most people who are competent and capable of being surgeons are cut out of before they're even 10 or 12 years old. So we just started where we say, okay, we run the lottery. If we're going to set the requirements of, you have to pass this test and this test. If you pass those tests, we're going to put you in the random drawing, and now you have a chance to be. And if you get through that test and you get through the next level and the next level, we'll let it down that way. Now wait a minute. Think about this. Think about this. Right now, we apparently have a shortage of doctors. We have a shortage of doctors because we don't educate them. If you have a group of people who have the ability to make sure those people they would like to get into medical school make it, they, and they have the ability to control the system, you're not going to get enough doctors. But if all of a sudden anybody can be a doctor, that group who controls no longer has the ability to guarantee their children or their grandchildren have the ability to be a doctor, and you have a shortage of doctors, all of a sudden you've thrown the whole country on the same side of the equation. We need more schools to get more doctors. So you can increase across the board the opportunity to be doctor. But you're not going to set the standards where any, anybody who wants to be can be doctor. You can always set a physical criteria, you know, in 16 years to get a driver's license. It's so what are the criteria for the president then? Uh, it's not the president's what it is. You, it's uh, 35 years of age. That's it? It's, there's three criteria written in the Constitution of the president. But what about being elected? Did you leave that out? Oh, um, I understand there's an election process. I'm talking about the qualifications. You can't get what you want through the election process. You have to be willing to ditch it. You have to have an alternative process. The reason you want, you need a government of the people, by the people, for the people. If you don't get it, you don't have a sustainable system. That means you have to be willing to live with the government of the people, by the people, for the people. If you have a bunch of idiots in your government, I recommend, they, I bet you what you do is you start and you quit making idiots. I'm sorry, I left you. Thank you. I'm sorry, but we are limiting ourselves to uh, three questioners. Let's uh, go to rebuttals. Uh, I think that we should go to rebuttals. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. How many favor the rebuttal? All right. Let's go to rebuttals. This is a kind of selection process. Is to the question. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Matter. Are you counting for rebuttals? Counting for rebuttals, Ethan. Yeah. Are you counting for rebuttals? Doesn't matter. Oh. Oh, you're for rebuttals. All right. We are in the rebuttal period. Rebuttal period. Rebuttals. All right. All right. Well, yeah, uh, behind every 
insist that there's a gun. At least five minutes. <laughs> five, five to seven, I think we can go. I want to thank our speaker for actually thinking about this for 25 years. There's a lot of good ideas in there. Uh, some of them are inconsistent, but uh, nonetheless, I think there's some, some seeds there that would work very well in a problematic or probability-based system. Um, in response to one of uh, Yala's uh, hypothetical situations regarding surgeons, um, in 1970 I had a vasectomy by a, a woman doctor who had the same name as me, Mayor. And uh, fortunately, she did not have Parkinson's disease. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you wouldn't enjoy it the time she was doing the surgery. <laughs> well, they sound self-selection. <laughs> Probability uh, is, is the essence of what you're, you're talking about, because um, a system-based as yours is, would probably work in some situations, but for how long, I don't know. Now, you mentioned the fact that everyone who was elected to any office would be, in fact, working in their own interests and would have no influence upon all the rest. They would try to persuade their fellow legislators or uh, others uh, to go along with this. Now, my great, 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 great grandfather was John Marshall. He was the second Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. When John Adams was president, he appointed him as uh, Chief Justice. At that time, the quote, citizens or people were those who were very wealthy, owned property, uh, and the rest of us didn't count. But we, that group was the, the people. Uh, at, at that time, some of those people, the people, uh, were worried that there would be laws passed by the uh, House of Representatives, which was elected only by those who owned property, passed by the Senate, uh, which was appointed by the governors of states at that time, and signed by the president, who was elected by the Electoral College, uh, that such a law would, might not be in their interest. So my ancestor came along and says, I have the solution. If any law is passed which infringes on the right of the people, those special people, uh, I will declare it unconstitutional. And he did. He declared unconstitutional 44 perfectly valid laws uh, because they were not in the interest of certain of those people. Uh, and I think that uh, something like your system would have to uh, take it, take that into account. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, Joe Meyer uh, have uh, blown up my cover because I am an ignoramus. I couldn't see any good of this uh, speech, and uh, so I would have to have a better brain to dig into that. Uh, on that person's speech, uh, yes, the, yeah. Yeah. He, he, he may have an incredible, powerful, and beautiful solution to society's problems, but he, were, he was very successful in keeping away from us. It was totally impossible to understand anything he said. His understanding of uh, evolution is so ridiculous, is so... Uh, out of out of touch with anything. I don't know how he had the courage to be in front of people and expose that ignorance. It's really sad. Um, how uh, he create he he put a lot of effort times according to what he says and, and uh, as uh, Chuck pointed out of the second law of his law of organization physics. Uh, he, he put the second law and it's, it's a contradicted in itself. The other, so, so how, how can uh, so much study lead to such a uh, 
this mock presentation. I, I don't know what that. Um, then he mentioned about that evolution, uh, the, the fundamental social organizations, the relationship with physics is with the atoms organization. I mean, it's, it just, it just uh, completely, completely out of out of, of left field somewhere. I mean, religion would be more based on some kind of uh, logic of thinking than this type of thinking. Um, and, and so he, he, he does this, he tried to impress with his personality because he got that, and you know, because of that, and, 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 and this, is, this is kind of the way that many people do in, in, in religious uh, circles, in religious circles, the, the nun is talking about this bullshit and she's smiling like, Oh, that is so wonderful that God says, you cannot count the fish, or you cannot count the, the clouds. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? And so there is this type of, of, of presentation, of acting, that people use to try to impress knowledge. But uh, don't open your mouth, because it just, it just feels very sure of it. Uh, so anyway, that uh, I I am totally, totally uh, disgusted with the with the presentation. We didn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> if I needed to don't, say it, <laughs> don't critique what you don't understand. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah, that's right. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> I don't understand. Sorry. Can I can I have my three dollars back? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't pay her? No. God, I should not pay now. I did not pay, I should not pay. <laughs> Charles, come on, I mean, you know, I thought you could not... You well, if you're not paying... <laughs> yeah. Okay. If you're not paying, then you don't speak. Okay. Stick on the topic. You know, I mean... I thought you could not do the protest well, but you could not do other other things well. <laughs> you know what you should have done? You should have gone out to everybody and say, "Hey guys, you want to shop at Walmart? Bang!" <laughs> you know. Yeah. You know. Um, no, I mean sometimes sometimes we get a speak God's time, you know. And uh, probably I think he came second time, and uh, I do not know how that happens. Uh, uh, no, first time, I mean, you must have this experience, you know, and second time, I don't know, I don't know. I think uh, probably we can do better, anyway. Uh, the, as far as the election is concerned, my candidate lost, and, pro and, uh, and probably he should have lost, okay? I mean, I think, he, I think uh, uh, one thing uh, which uh, the winner, probably not Obama, but uh, when there is just somebody whom nobody knows, because uh, it's a brave new world. Uh, it's a technology at work. What happened is technology at work. Somebody figured it out how to use technology to manipulate American people. And that's what happened. And he exactly knew whom to manipulate, which switches to pull, and where to pull and how to pull it. He knew where that person lives, where the, what that person does, what is his phone number, what is his tax basis number, and he did it and, and, I, and what to tell him when and, and that's what won. We are in trouble, gentlemen. Forget about what this democracy or all this thing. What we do not have, we are losing our rights to technology. The people who, who, who created those technology, we will never know. Those few guys who must have, who must have put all these things together and the idea in some dark room would have been conceived, we do not know what happened. And this is exactly, I was telling you, Charles, that uh, Walmart have their technology, you know, and you cannot win. They, they, they know, they know exact, exactly what to advertise, what kind of deal to make, 
and they did a four items, uh, and they say, hey, you know, people are just lying up there. They say, they, they, they sell, they sold four millions of those items. You know, so, you, I mean, you are no match there. Okay, you are, you are doing a, like a George Mini's days of protest. You know, you are, you are, you should not have tried it even. I tell, I tell you something, if you are going to do something, Technology is a factor, gentlemen. If you if you are not going to pay attention to technology, okay, Ramni, how stupid one could be. For a such a for a guy such a making big money and your five sons, he could not manage the campaign. He took it for granted that he's a great man. He's a good man. Do you know four years before before Hillary Clinton did? Because she's a good woman. She loves this country. Okay? Forget it. You love, you are good or you love this country, it doesn't matter. Does it matter? There are other factors at work. Okay, it's just like a chicken in every house, chicken at every house. Same <coughs> way, you know, we are losing our liberty and this is what is happening to us. And if you are going to do protest, a protest, I wrote you how to do it. And whether you like it or not, but that's the way to go to future. But uh, as far as the speakers, I like to I like to have a little. Well, you know what I mean, right? Uh, All right. Yeah. Hey, you have the money. Why? How come the mask? You were there. No. Because. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, you, have to, you have to pay three dollars for the entertainment value. Three dollars for five minutes. Now look, you know, I sort of keep my mouth shut and walked out. No, you know. Sit down. Okay. Man, you know, uh, people, I, I have to say Who that, says people get old? One second, okay? Who says people get old, their memory doesn't work as fast? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My memory is failing on a daily basis, but anyway. Um, your speech really showed a profound misunderstanding and ignorance of any uh, scientific things, of the theory of evolution, of any sociological theories, of any biological science theories, it showed a truly profound ignorance of any of that. Evolution is not that some parts of some animals find their way into parts of other animals or come out and go into other parts of other animals. I mean, that's... Uh, Charles Darwin, uh, uh, over a five-year study on the beagle when uh, it made its trip in, in the, um, uh, the beginning of the 19th century, um, went all the way around the world, literally, and saw the diversity of animals and found fossils, and then, um, and in fact, uh, uh, in concert with other people, other scientists who had come up with similar ideas, came up with uh, came up with uh, species development as a result of characteristic changes that were driven by changes in the environment, and that you had to have an isolate, and that eventually that was refined. That you had to have an isolation of this of a group of the same species that then, uh, from the rest of the species, that then were subject to different environmental conditions and then be over a long period of time, that group of animals then developed into another species. After um, he uh, published this, um, actually Mendel, who, um, Gregor Mendel, actually discovered the mechanism by which this was done, but his workings, uh, his writings, and, and published on it long before Charles Darwin did, but published in an obscure journal in, in, Czech, in what is now Czechoslovakia, and um, that, that knowledge was not really uh, discovered by the general scientific community until the early 1900s, and that was the mechanism of how the characteristics developed that you had um, you had uh, things that were in the in the seeds that in, in the plants that then determined what the characteristics were, and and then Watson and Crick discovered uh, DNA. So now that the mechanism became 
much more defined and changes in DNA is how the changes happened. And the changes in DNA that were random mutations then were, for environmental pressures, selected for if they were uh, made it more likely for the species to survive. Now, this is a theory, a scientific theory, that is accepted by about 95 or 98 percent of recognized biological scientists in the world. And the, the, all of the evidence that we, are just, that we come up with now conforms to that theory. There isn't anything that really directly contradicts that theory. And in fact, this theory is used to predict what will happen scientific, what our scientific discoveries will be. We use the, um, the uh, bio, uh, paleontologists at the University of Chicago and um, along with a group of people from um, the University of Wisconsin and, and, and other areas got together and decided that the transitional species between fish and amphibians developed about 350 million years ago and that, the, that there were rocks that were on the surface of the Earth, and the area that these rocks were on the surface of the Earth was around the North Pole, essentially, or a little bit away from the North Pole, but up around the Arctic Circle. And so the, the rocks that they were looking for would be in Siberia or in northern Canada, and so that they were going to go look for this species in those rocks. And it took them five years, and they found the species on the northern end of Ellesmere Island because that's where they were looking, on the end of the fifth summer that they were there because you can't go there in the wintertime because it's 50 below zero or 70 below zero or whatever. So they predicted what they found. Charles Darwin, in fact, predicted that a species such as Archaeopteryx would be found. I'm saying some sense here. I can deserve another minute. Um, and, um, and, and in fact, the year after he published, the year after he published The Origin of the Species, Archaeopteryx was found, and it was a, uh, a dinosaur that had a, an actual feather, a modern feather, and it was very clear in the stone that it was found. It was found in, uh, in Germany in... Um, lithographic. The, yeah, it was lithographic quality stone. It was found in Bavaria. And it was found in a stone quarry that they were trying to get stones that they would do the lithographs that were used for that purpose to print things. So, you know, it's predictive and, um, and it's there's an enormous amount of evidence that supports it. It's accepted by all of the recognized um, evolutionary science, or all of the recognized biological sciences. In fact, biologist um, uh, Wallace in the 1930s, which was not that long, which was less than 100 years after um, he published it, said that without evolution, nothing in biology makes any sense at all. So now you understand why human behavior is so fishy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, there is no, no reason actually. I have some background uh, in sociology and social psychology. And uh, Margaret is right that to give this kind of talk, you really need to, to have a, a good background in, uh, in both and in biology. Um, but um, I do admire, I mean, the posit I do admire your uh, ideals, and uh, I think you are, no, no, I think this, this would be a great utopia. I still it is utopia. Um, and we need to face reality. Um, so, to, and as a sociologist, I can say that well, systems do affect human behavior and the results that we get 
but um, still humans also interact, the individual interacts with the creation and the manipulation of the system. So you cannot really separate it. And the difference between physics laws and uh, social and human laws or um, psychological laws is that the um, human and social laws are not really laws like in physics. They are directions with a lot of variability around them. So if there, if, if, if there is a linear or, or non-linear uh, direction, there is so much variability that predictions really are hard to make. Um, so, for example, yes, uh, there is this, we, we are born with a need for a community and cooperation. I don't know if you are born with it, but this is adaptable. At the same time, aggression is also adaptable to protect us. And we were there like always, uh, it, it, you know, with, with, with the same conflict. Both, both forces um, are, we are born with dispositions for both aggression and community. Uh, as dispositions, and they come about in different ways according to the way that we socialize. So too, um, but to assume that that uh, there is one system that can shape human behavior is a mistake. Uh, you gave football as the model, as the role model for a system. Well, look at football players. I mean, many of them abuse their partners and have very, very poor social skills. So do physicists. Um, and sociologists. And, and sociologists. And, yeah, I, 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 actually, sociologists seem to be the most radical, uh, the radical activist you can find. Um, Football players um, have a bad reputation. System that works. No. Maturity. Okay. Uh, you started with the brain. Um, the studies that you have explored are old-fashioned and being refuted. The mass and the volume of the brain have nothing to do with maturity or intelligence. Um, maturity, and that's hard to, to define, but maturity is the type and complexity of the connections between systems of neurotransmitters um, and the ability to deal with complex issues. And people with, like, you know that Einstein had a very small brain, by the way. Yeah. yeah. So, um, he had a lot of hair, but <laughs> <laughs> um, again, uh, they, uh, I'm going back to my question about uh, presidents and uh, you know, equal of, and because we, we will go with the, with the brain, we are not born the same. Socialization has a lot to do, and how we are raised has a lot to do, how we are formed. But it's still, we are not blank slates, okay? And society doesn't write on us exactly. And, and if it does, it will never, with all the equal opportunity, will never create uniform people. So if you look, if the only criteria is age 35 or age 18 to be elected for president, look at the people here and who would you like to be your president? Me? Bob Mayor, you got my vote. Yeah. <laughs> I'm voting for anti matter. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I just want to say, Margaret, uh, 
not only do I have a bad short-term memory, I also have a bad short-term memory. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I kind of got what your line of thinking tonight. I think this was your best one. I think yours is your third time here. It takes Bob to do it. And, uh, yeah, I, I kind of you know, get what you're coming at. I'm willing to, you know, look at that. I mean, a lot of what he said, like Joe Mayer said, a lot of what he said, I mean, if we had this more or less, you know, kind of almost random selection of a president, I mean, it would eliminate, you know, all this other stuff that would be, the, the, you know, lobbying and campaign spending on it, all that stuff. It certainly would do all that. I'm going to have, I'd have to think for a while whether I want to go with that. But, I mean, look how we do jury selection. I mean, we, we put some important things in the hands of juries, and they're, they're more or less selected uh, pretty much at random. And we figure we're going to have a you know, slice of uh, average people. And, you know, if somebody was president, if they were selected this way, uh, you know, they would have advisors and stuff. I don't think they'd be acting really on their own so much. Yeah. Just like now, there's a lot of advice, you know, given and stuff. But, uh, you know, I don't know. I think maybe, you know, I would like to maybe see this tried on a experimental basis, maybe in some, you know, some kind of small, insignificant state. <laughs> like Rhode Island or something. Indiana. <laughs> Texas, Texas. No, they use it there already. Um, uh, quickly, but I, I think we're speeding you up about evolutions. But uh, it, it was Henry. It was Harry. It was uh, Herbert Spencer who said survival of the fittest, and that. Not Charles Darwin, but uh, so yeah, your evolution thing was a little bit off. I had to run to the bathroom, but I think somebody explained how natural selection works. That this, uh, you know, it's kind of a mutated gene. You know, your genes are constantly mutating. Re evolution never stops. We're evolving right now. Genes are always, you know, changing a little bit, mutating a little bit, and then sometimes if it's something that uh, helps that particular, uh, you know, individual survive a little better. Then he can pass that gene on, you know, by uh, by, pro by procreating. If it makes him a little taller, run a little faster, be a little smarter, drift some animal colors, feathers, or whatever. I mean, so so that's kind of how that works. Um, now I have to disagree with you though about capitalism. Capitalism, there's nothing you know that says violence. You know, needs to you know that violence is part of capitalism or it has to have a gun behind it. You know, that's yeah, you know. You do need a, a method of enforcing contracts. You know, we need, you know, government has to enforce contracts, so I suppose that, you know, you could say, well, yeah, guns necessary that way, but that's sort of one of the what prerequisites about, you need to enforce contracts. What about union thugs who show up? Well, see, again, that's coercion, and we don't want coercion. That's, that's coercion. We, you know, what, liberty is, the whole idea of liberty is, it's uh, freedom, people to freely, you know, hire who they want, to offer wages or for people to enter into contracts, you know that's that's what they want. Now, freedom to disobey a contract. Freedom. No, you're not free to disobey. Well, if you enter into a contract, then you need to, you know, uh, abide by the terms of that contract, assuming you went into that contract, you know, voluntarily. But, uh, you know, a a uh, the problem with unions is that that it, you know is that the Owner is compelled to to enter into a contract. Collective bargaining. And uh, yeah, that's that's cult, that's that's coercion by the government. Using the government saying, "Oh, this 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 outfit says that you know they all sign these union cards." And guess what? You got a union. You got to sit down and negotiate a table, and the government will send an arbiter in, and then of course they will always side with the the uh, union guys because they're 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 the voters. You know? It's that's the thing. Now the, now the the what I you know the good thing about his system with the with the randomized basically president is that when you have an intentional presidency, you've got people with agendas coming. And the agenda of government or, or these of these parties is to win privilege for their supporters. At the detriment of the other people, that's what it's all about. So I hope you read the uh, the menace of privilege by Henry George Jr. It'd be nice if you show up at our, at our at our meeting at the end of January, our book club meeting, and and uh, participate. That would be very interesting. But I think the problem here is that it's really you know all, all this, this trying to fix the pre the presidential elections and all that. That's not 
that's addressing the symptoms, but not going to the, really the root of the problem. And the root of the problem maybe is that we have, you know, too much, we have privilege that's been dished out, it's caused this imbalance, this skewing of economics, privilege. where we have a yeah. few that get everything, and everybody else gets Thank nothing. You. And what are some of the, the, big, the biggest privilege that we're all subject to is, of course, private collection of the economic rent of land, which is uh, you know, private pocketing of, of, uh, of land value, rather than that good getting paid to the government. But there's other privileges too. I mean, the yeah. the uh, disbursement of the of the yeah. of the ele electromagnetic spectrum. To, you know, certain companies are allowed. You know, the, the big broadcasters get that. You know, it's like a monopoly. Anything you can have like monopoly on. You know, so that or even having taxi cab licenses. You know, those are privileges. Having a privatized parking. Somebody's paying for privilege, right? They're, they, they, somebody bought privilege. You know, they, they bought influence in government or whatever and were awarded contracts. And this privilege, uh, you know, re has rewarded them. And this, this is why banks, you know, bankers and, and banking have had such favorable tax laws and rules governing them and the oil business and all that because they've paid for the influence in Washington to get that stuff. So, but if we had a lot smaller government, that wouldn't be so necessary. If we got stuck down more to what Adam Smith and Henry George wrote about, if we had, you know, free markets, uh, people able to enter into free contracts uh, voluntarily, and have, you know, free trade, uh, and, and really kept government limited to providing for the common defense and enforcing contracts, and not so much all that other stuff, it wouldn't be so necessary. There, would probably, there wouldn't be that big... Uh, urge to participate in politics and game the system. It's unnecessary to game the system. You've got all the fucking cards in your hands. Right? Yeah. Then you don't have to game the system. I'll start my two. Well, I think we should give the speaker a hand for showing us what it's like to think outside the box and for, uh, if for, if for no other reason than being aware of what's going on in America on the planet and saying it's not working. Uh, here's a, here's a few quick facts I just wrote down, observations that are, are pretty much, as Margaret said, 95% accepted by people that are, uh, actually study the evidence and know what's going on. 99 maybe. We'll go with 99. Our military spends a trillion dollars a year. More than double, you know, we, our 5% of the people spend more than the rest of the world. A trillion dollars a year going down the military rat hole. The middle class in America is facing outright extinction. We've been under attack for 30, 32 solid years. Yeah. The Republican Congress, uh, or the re more or less the Republican Party in general, but especially the Congress, is the greatest giant intellectual whorehouse on the planet. <laughs> There's no other way to say it. I mean, these people are the best paid intellectual prostitutes you're going to find anywhere. Democratic Party is infiltrated with a bunch of these people running Republicans masquerading as Democrats to get elected. So it's, but this last election, talk about uh, a miracle happening, a bunch of computer hackers under the name Anonymous monitored some of the servers in real time and stole it back for Obama. Romney and Rove and everybody else was shocked that uh, the, the, you know, the people's will was finally being done. The votes weren't being switched in Ohio like they set up. Uh, the, the fix was in three weeks earlier and Romney was all bent out of shape and we paid good money to buy the state of Ohio. What the hell happened? And it turns out that there's uh, some good guys out there. They're, uh, outside the law too, they hacked into everything and watched it real time. Global warming and climate change, <laughs> the latest numbers out of uh, James Hansen from NASA and a bunch of others are looking at satellite projections. Uh, they're constantly revising the numbers downward of how soon we're going to be at the tipping point where uh, the Greenland ice sheet and a bunch of other stuff just melts and the sea levels come up 30 or 40 feet, and Manhattan's underwater, along with other sea coast cities. They, we'll be talking about that next week. I got a Xerox copy if anybody wants to study between now and then. 
they set the date at 215, 2015. Uh, two and a half years from now, give or take a few months, let's say, if we don't get a massive type Manhattan project, the Apollo Moonshot project, some kind of massive project going to cut down the burning of all kinds of fossil fuels, then it's over for our great grand great grandkids. Kids that are little now, they're going to be living on a planet like something out of a science fiction movie. No other issue matters if 90% uh, of the human population is eliminated in half a generation, maybe less, as people start migrating in from the sea level. Um, America has, today we have the widest disparity of wealth since the pharaohs walked the earth. <laughs> um, and we're seeing right now, uh, two weeks ago we saw the, the greatest repudiation of a governing philosophy in the elections. Uh, if, if the votes had really been counted, it would have been a 10 or 15 million vote landslide for Obama. And people weren't just voting for Obama, they were trying to vote criminals out of office. And a lot of the Republican, a lot of the criminals, I, I say criminals masquerading as Republicans, the ones that thought uh, rape was okay, uh, women just, you know, ignore that kind of thing, it'll just go away. Uh, those guys, those crazy bastards, got voted out, almost every one of them. And we have, uh, we have there, there's a house cleaning going on right now in America. People are waking up. The middle class is waking up. Their, their sons and daughters are coming home from college. Massive debt and no hope of getting a living wage job in America. They're living in their old bedroom or in mom and dad's basement or something else. I mean, I, I, I fully applaud uh, our speaker's question tonight saying, if we just selected a president and a congress at random, could they do any worse than what we've got? <laughs> yep, I don't think so. I think uh, 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 I got a few more seconds. Uh, Representative Jim Hightower, uh, yeah, from Jim Hightower from Texas, uh, published a, uh, my fast. He published a book called Thieves in High Places in 2003. You talk about our elected officials. He he listed a whole bunch of bills that uh, Bush Cheney regime had passed in the first two years. He said, look through this list of pizzas of legislation, bills. said, find anything in there that you don't have to uh, address with uh, hip waders or rubber gloves and a gas mask. This stuff is toxic. He said, How, ask yourself what kind of people would pass legislation like that. Well, the answer comes back very quick. People with a normal people with a pulse and a conscience won't go anywhere near this kind of stuff. For that kind of legislation to be passed, you need perverts. You need people that are sexually perverted with no ethics, morals, and conscience. They're intellectual perverts that can be bought and sold and have no ethics, morals, and conscience. And you wonder why there's so many sexual uh, scandals in the Republican Party is because they seek out those kind of people and put them in high places all through the Republican Party and in our Congress. Our Congress is infested with these people right now. And I don't think, you know, I, I applaud our speaker for saying, uh, let's think outside the box before America and the rest of the world heads toward extinction. We don't have another four, five, ten years to have debates like this, to mess around with this. we got to get something going. And I, I applaud anybody that's thinking outside the box. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I shall be brief. I do thank our speaker for coming here and facing the lions and the lions down. <laughs> however, yes, there's religion for you. Please. Having said that, however, I listened to his ideas. And it seems to me what I was kind of listening to was an accountant's view of life. That if you punch in the right number, something, is going to, something good is going to come out. And it doesn't take into account that people are not numbers, and that life isn't always a series of random choices. Um, to get back to what Bob was saying, for example, he alleged that um, when people come into office, they come in with an agenda of privileges to reward their followers. Well, when Franklin Roosevelt came into office in 1933, his sole agenda was to get people 
fed, clothed, and back to work, and to put, uh, put America back on a sound footing again. When John Kennedy came into office in 1961, I don't know that he had any agenda to uh, give privileges away. He came and he took charge of an America that was good, but not for everyone. And his basic purpose was to take an America that had gotten too grooved and too slack and, too con and, and had focused too much on the idea of conformity. And he got the country moving again in new and positive directions. He did that, unfortunately, his work was cut short, as we all know. The bottom line um, here is this. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not in favor of an idea of a system that works only in a universe, as Joe put it, where it's based on a system of probabilities. It was with difficulty that I bore asking you what would have happened if President Kennedy, while he was had put your system into operation, while he was negotiating with the Russians to try and get the missiles out of Cuba. Thank you. As much as I'd like, as much as I'd like to, you know, critique the speech and, and give you a little bit more of an evaluation on it, and that kind of thing can be left for a discussion offline. What I'm here to tell you is that I honestly think that the probability of selecting a presidential candidate for me could be nothing further than sheer craziness. Here's why I say this. Yes, you do have some minimum qualifications to be in office, but the reason that we elect a president and the primary reason we elect the president is to represent us around the world as a world leader. And there are certain things that the campaign process brings out in a leader that will allow him to be qualified for president. For example, the long campaign process, you have to <coughs> not only convince a staff of volunteers to raise money for you, but then you have to raise money and, and, and get an organization in place and have a party and do all kinds of other things that you need to do as a president in government. And it's in a lot of ways a, a, a practice run beforehand. The process may be a lot longer than we'd like in some cases, but the job of the president primarily is to be that of a communicator, to be that of a speech maker, to be that of one who can drive a vision of coming forth. The second thing he needs to do is to find the right people for him to put that vision forward. Unfortunately, we had one who sole objective in George W. Bush was to get into war in Iraq after 9-11. And his whole thing was to keep America safe at that time. But in his misguided ways, we had two elective wars. We had the, he had put the people in place to do that. Now, with Obama, for example, the one of the reasons we have elected him is we saw a breath of hope through his motivational speaking style, and he then tried as well to get our economy back in shape. I've seen myself some very great divisions in here. You know, some business guys who think Obama's the worst part of the world, and other people who think he's the best thing for sliced, since sliced bread. But I do know this, we just went through a long, arduous campaign process to select the best person for the job. And I believe that the invention of the election is less than a couple hundred years old. And it's now been universally adopted around the world as a selection for governing systems. Yes, it is corrupt. Yes, it can be subject to manipulation. But I'll put it like this to you. Yes, democracy is the most inefficient, most craziest form of government, except for all the rest. Yeah, I'll give you one. <laughs> all right. Okay. I'm going to give you one better than that. Let's thank our speaker again. We <laughs> missed a lot of time and effort here to try to graphically show you guys. I'm going to jump around here. I already got that out of the way. You kind of stole my thing. I was going to say, 
And the Republicans probably could have found the better candidate had they had it chosen at random. That's <laughs> 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 son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, the Mormon faith is, is, there's a lot of, if you get the comparative study of religions, that's the one that was founded by aliens from the Pleiades. <laughs> now that's what that's this one fell apart. Oh. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, well it's too bad the angry white men didn't didn't win prevail in this election here, you know. But um Let's see. All right, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to pick on you, Kurt, here. You know, your first law here, you claim to be a man of science, but that's the definition of God. <laughs> it is, it's Genesis. In the beginning and so forth. That, that's, that's God here. The other thing is, you, you're talking on, a, and it's a tough topic here, I began working my working life in the Office of Economic Opportunity and I had occasion to think about what exactly are opportunities and why do we want to increase them for people. It's not easily done. Uh, certain people seem to think they do, but what are true opportunities? It's freedom of choice among viable options in which you make a, a decision, hopefully a correct decision, and people are lacking in opportunities, certainly in a capitalist system. It's a, it's a narrow scope system and very restricted in terms of opportunities. Um, regarding your scientific approach to society, I think you've got to begin with a fundamental unit. We had the guy last week, and what did he do? He talked for an hour and how they were trying to crack apart the atom and the portions of the atom. And the, the, we've got even a thing here, what are the different particles? that constitute an atom, and that's how they wanted to understand the universe. Um, this guy here looks through a telescope, while others are looking in the atoms. But collectively together, now a fundamental unit I think would be the person, or the individual. Uh, another unit I would choose if a scientific study of society would be the interaction. Um, or let's call it a relationship. Perhaps now, economists like to use the fundamental unit as, as the monet, as some exchange of value. That's how they do it. And uh, I think even Henry George claimed they have a scientific approach, but they have reduced everything to, you know, uh, capitalist transactions as, as all of society. And that's really not the approach that I would recommend here. <laughs> but uh, I would think now. It's not that it hasn't been done before, and when I use the term the fundamental unit is relationships, uh, communism is based on the idea that you would have good relationships. And if everybody had good relationships, you'd have a good society and everybody would be good. If you have non-competitive relationships or cooperative relationships, uh, and you rearrange it in such fashion, uh, yes, the, the common good would emerge from that. So that, yeah, they, the, that approach has been used and you were saying, well, I couldn't find any system better, that's one that's infinitely better. If you want a system based on relationships based on competitiveness or exploitation, and you're telling me that's the best, Charlie, that's I think it's, cool. no, I, I think, no, I think, I think as you're much wrong, as, I can, as much as I can extract from somebody else with minimal effort. That's no, that's not, that's not the fundamental the premise. That's a definition. How much, if you can get people to work for you, make you rich, for, you know, the more people you can get to make to work for your benefit, that, that defines a society. But I first have to convince them. I first have to convince them to buy a product. That's the greatest I good. then have to say. All right, one full at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad. Now I got to pick on Bob. During the week, Bob told me, and he recommended everybody, to watch that thing on the Dust Bowl. And he's running around here saying, oh, the fundamental unit of all economy is land. And I watch this thing for two nights. And it's the last thing I'm going to invest in is land. It has of no permanent value. These guys had land, and it was farmland one day, and after a couple of years, it would look like the Sahara Desert. 
and you can open an entire economic system based on land. And I couldn't imagine why he wanted me to watch that show, because it told me every Henry George is full of shit. <laughs> but anyhow, and the other thing is, pal, you, you get up here and say, hey, oh, we're going to have contracts. But when a collective people, known as the employees of an operation, come together, and say we want to a collective contract, collective bargain, you say, oh no, we're not allowed. We're not allowed. Those aren't allowed. Long All long other long contracts long are okay, long except long the ones you want. That you say, oh, you can have this kind, but not this kind. Well, that's not the relationships. You have a relationships with the people who built the factory and keep it going, whether you like it or not. Now you could pretend they don't exist or something like that, but what is your relationship with the people who operate that concern. What is, define it for me. Master and slave or what? That's it. Come on, let's hear it. It's, 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 volunt it's volunt volunteer. Volunteer my volunteer ass. <laughs> There's nothing in society volunteer you have to provide for. Oh, yeah. What is this? I'm a lonely. All right, thanks a lot. <laughs> Volunteer, yeah, workers, workers, workers star. That's a volunteer. Yeah, volunteer, my. You want to volunteer for capitalism? There's a gun. System defined by the gun. Bill. Yeah. Uh, uh, <coughs> I really couldn't get anything much out of this talk tonight, except for random selection of public officials, which might be an improvement in the way we do it now, but you can't really compare it to a jury because a jury of several people and it's supposed to represent public opinion. Random selection of individuals. Is, uh, you do on a large enough scale of micro, bear some resemblance to public opinion, but uh, I rather doubt it. And juries don't have to run in there. It's just a temporary body. You know, it last to make that, they don't have to run in anything. But I didn't really catch anything here about laws. I thought it was very, very interesting. Someone said the individual, the unit of individual analysis is the individual. Well, somehow that's about what Ludwig von Mises said. Basis, based, system is based on a, a law that everyone is seeking to substitute a, a better situation for a less preferable situation. Well, you can read his own books if you want. So I can provide you some references. But that's, that, that's, that, that, that's what he said. That comes up to a volunteer. The voluntary uh, organization of society. He, he uh, espouses the deductive method, which is based on a priori principles. Yeah. One of those means. You know, prove it. Precise predictions, but uh, there, 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 there is a, a pretty fair amount of predictive value there. Uh, I didn't see anything radical about the system we heard about tonight. It's just a different way of. Selecting public officials, a different way of selecting public officials. Same public officials that we have now, basically. I think we have, you're not really going to do anything radical unless you learn to distinguish between a political process 
and an economic process. And once you start doing that and try quit collar and bullshit, I think maybe we'll get somewhere. Speaker gets the last word. Speaker gets the last word. Speaker gets the last word. We got Brown. Oh, sorry. Yeah. What would Jesus say? Well, Jesus didn't like to put chances to say it. What are the three laws of Jesus? When you didn't mention Genesis. Love thy neighbor. Love, love thy neighbor. Thou shalt love the God. Never mind. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Well, they choose the Pope randomly, don't they? I don't think they're a conclave. Time up. Well, anyway. What we have is. Fairly, uh, you, you may think it arbitrary, but we have a, a, a process which is consultative. Uh, we do, it's not just the legislature, it's not just the courts that are consultative, but our electoral process is consultative. And we do eliminate uh, uh, people from that pro in that process uh, that uh, do not have a sufficient appeal to the uh, public uh, to be considered uh, uh, candidates. Uh, we had. Uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs uh, the, in the Republican Party. <laughs> and uh, Snow White uh, being uh, the Romney. Uh, he, he could be apt, at least. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they were all bad. Uh, really. And Barack Obama was like a, 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 a shining star uh, compared to them. Uh, except you know, Romney did have some appeal. I mean, uh, he's white. He's white. He has <laughs> Somebody who has played by the system uh, successfully. He loves Yeah, uh, he had been elected governor of Massachusetts. And he had uh, <laughs> and, and served uh, with. He served. Uh, yeah, I, was he ever re-elected governor? No. 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 But. You know, I mean, he had run for president before. He had um, spent a good deal of his time being the uh, candidate for president. Uh, he should have learned. A good deal, part of his life. Uh, he'd been a, a bishop of the uh, Mormon Church. Uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints. He was a uh, bishop. And he wore a And he tried. Well, <laughs> look, the, these yeah, Mormons, mm -hmm. really, uh, they are earnest people uh, who uh, try to abide by the rules of their church. Uh, they are try, they try to, to do good works. Uh, they they really, care. they do. I hide the money in the camera. I, I certainly don't uh, think very highly of uh, their theology or their their. Uh, it's nonsensical. Uh, when, when it looks, uh, when I look at their history, I, I think of 
them as being quite arbitrary, but uh, but they are people I'm, of I'm faith. Go, oh, yes. <laughs> but we do have a consultative process, uh, and that has a value uh, in history. Uh, it has a use value, uh, and uh, although uh, there are all sorts of warps to it, it's certainly better than uh, a completely arbitrary system. All right, thank, thank you. You're not a Mormon, are you? <laughs> of absolute speculation. You can observe trends. You can point out behaviors. But you can't correlate cause and effect with behaviors to explain why things happen predictably. And you cannot, on the basis of that, break systems you? that allow for changes that people would aspire to get to. The retailers do it all the time. Study systems and report on them, please do. But that doesn't do me any good. Because you actually don't have a system. Look you can't analysis. behave. Well, you brought this argument up. No. You brought it too. You told me I didn't know my sociology. Well, yeah, you don't. You don't. Okay. <laughs> you can cannot that argue that. I mean, you can make that assumption. I can predict no, I, that. Assumption is and not. The, the, the rule here is anything that I don't see in an hour, I don't know. Right. No. I, I can predict know. a lot of human right. behavior. No, no, you no. said in an hour. You don't now, let's care. talk about evolution for a minute. I'm going to revisit this. Okay, so I you should. I'm going to with you. Now, we're talking about, yes, there are two aspects mm -hmm. to evolution. One is that this change in species occurs as a result in changes within the species to, co to, co to contend with changes in the environment. Mm -hmm. That's the first part. The second part is it is a random, uncontrolled process. No, it's not uncontrolled. It is. Um, actually, it is. It is a it is a process. It is. Would you go ahead and take your moment then? What do you no, mean? go ahead. No, there's no. I there's mean, no direction know, to this process. There is no direction to this process. It goes where it will, as it will, and it went by where it did, as it did, without any direction or design to that system. No. That's the second no. part no. of evolution. There are Utili evolutionary utility. scientists that say that. But go what, what, what do they say? Well, you no, have to read go it. Ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. Learn. I have read my evolution. Learn. 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 Okay. You need I to have read Darwin. I have read Beak of the Finch. I have read many books on evolution. Yeah. Okay. It takes it more is, than reading. It is unmanaged. It is driven strictly by changes in the environment. There is no control over that process. <coughs> the point is that, yes, you see the changes in species. You can document the changes in species. You can correlate the change. You can, you can line up the species, just like you can line up the, all, the, all the years of automobiles that have come through the line. You can say, this one came before that one, that one came before that one, because this one bears that trait, and it showed up there first, and it showed up here, and then they modified it, and it became a different trait, and it came through another vehicle that looks very different, and we can trace its lineage. And you're doing the same thing in evolution. Now, cars didn't run down the road and interact with the environment and decide they would be better if they were lower and flatter and wider. They didn't go that way with an unmanaged, undirected process. But that's what we're claiming actually happens with the, 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 the animal species. But we actually don't have any 
prove that yet. Oh, we have never oh, seen, oh, we have we never documented the, the, the observable process from species to species. In fact, we have. But we have not seen it. We have. We Where have. did we see it? Under well, a microscope with bacteria, yeah, oh. but go ahead. Well, okay, well, now, now what, we have, what we have, help. what we have is we have not had, we have not had transition on the level of, we had a bacteria, we had a bacteria, we had a bacteria. We had different bacteria. We have not had a transition from bacteria to earthworm or anything of that nature. We have never had that. And that's but the that's process. Not how it happens. There were steps in between. Yeah, there were a lot of steps. But there, there hasn't been a step outside of species yet. Outside of, uh, there has not been a, there's not been a bacteria that's no longer a bacteria that moved into something besides bacteria. It's still a bacteria. That's my point. You haven't moved out of bacteria yet. You said we're getting change in bacteria. Yeah, you're just demonstrating your your ignorance. Okay. Yeah, all right. Just demonstrating your ignorance. That's all. Uh, you haven't said that's you, fine. You may have read the books, but you didn't understand what you were reading. That's fine. The point is, you know, you have, that the process by which did evolution occurred has not yet been proven at the level of science. It's still oh, a theory. Of course it has. Oh. It's still a theory. Of course it's been, dem it's been demonstrated. Okay. It's accepted as a scientific theory. Let him finish, Margaret. If we go to the scientific community, they, they agree the argument exists. OK, this is the problem we get into. Within the scientific community, there's no argument on the process as a process. There is still argument as to how the process occurs. There are two different apples. But we'll go on. You can, I mean, feel free to go look, but we don't have to. Now, people don't like the idea of a random selection of government. But they're insisting on a random selection in, in nature that works. Well, if it works there, why wouldn't it work in our system? <laughs> There's a selection process in nature. Why not for president? Why not let it like There is a process. Why not let it run like nature? One bird lives, one doesn't. That's a process. People will live, people will die. That's not the issue. Oh. Now, there's, a, there's an issue that's come up that I don't want to give you any laws. I want to tell you what this world will look like. That's because I've made a bet. I made a bet. You solve the problem with your government. I would, I, would never, I would never want to tell you what laws you have to live under. You solve the problem of government, you will get the laws that you enjoy living with. Just like you get laws that work on the roads. You saw them. I don't need to make those laws. I don't know what they would be. I really don't know what the answers to many of these questions are. I don't have the information. You get a group of people let, who have, get the, let them make the decisions. I have confidence that they would make the wise decisions because they would work for the government. You would no longer have the vested interests who control the process to get their decision mm -hmm. and their choice out of it. That's what it is. It isn't a matter. I'm not going to lay down what laws you should behave by. I don't know what they are. I wouldn't be interested. It's, that's not what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in becoming king of the world. I don't want to do that. I want to live in a fucking world where I don't have to be king to, to live my fucking inherent rights intact. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be your king. I don't want to make rules for you, and I don't want people to live under it. All I want to do is advise a system that cooperatively we can figure out how to make it for all of us. I don't care to be a king. I don't care to be a manager. It's not what I do. It's not what I'd be interested in. I wouldn't be interested ever. But I don't want to be the slave of somebody who gets in there and makes gets to turn the world against me. That's my concern. I'll solve that problem. I think I know how to solve that one. That's all I'm interested in. I don't want to say. So I'm not going to tell you what rules you live under. I say, let's put a body in there and let them deliberate. Now, the, the, I want to talk about, I, I think, um, Tim, you made the comment about uh, elections. 
Collections have a deep and long history. They were used in Greece. Once again, they were landowners, just as they are today. All, all I forget, we all get to all, but the very small group actually gets to make the decisions. And um, the Catholic Church, if you study the history of the Catholic Church, when it originated, they actually had a popular election for Pope. And then they converted to the first, basically, Electoral College. <laughs> they called it the Cardinals. And, the and at that point, the Cardinals began electing that official that began to carry the church's agenda, agenda forward rather than the agenda of the Catholic community. So it worked very well. And so I suspect that's partly why it was adopted in the United States back when it was, which was sometime in the early 1800s, because it was an ingenious little idea to let a group continue Better to appoint its own electors to control. It works. Fabulous. We are model dependent people. We study the world before us and we adopt the methods to look for it. And that worked for us. Um, it's 11 o'clock. This is, um, I mean, Yeah, you can play with it. It's, it's all that. I mean, I can't do it all in one hour. I couldn't do it in three hours. I couldn't do it in five hours. No. You've got to go through so many things. you got to study a buttload to get a hold of this. But, like I said, you guys like to take your bats to anything I don't say. You know, actually, and I do know my... I do know my biology to the degree that I understand a lot more than people think I do. And my sociology to the degree that I understand a lot more than, I, than you think I do. I mean, I'm 50 years old. I spent a long time studying a lot of things. You know, I can't, I can't study every field on earth to become an expert in it. You know, I still have to do at the degree that anyone in this room could be an expert on any one field. You know, experts in but I will tell you that, you know, I'll bring it, I'll remind you of something that um, I, I spoke in the beginning of. This has happened so many times through history, it's actually not funny. But Edward Howell, Edward Howell, in 1919, figured out in 1909, whenever it was, figured out the enzyme and the value of the enzyme. Yeah. He went against the okay. entire scientific community. Everything. And it took basically 60, 70, 90 years for him to get there. He was dead before his work was really verified. It happened many times. Let's do that. Golden, golden nugget on the west side of the park. Okay. We'll, we'll see There's so much that we operate on that hasn't been proven true, that we accept as true. And just like you pre pushed up, design, the, the design, okay, one more point and I'll be done. One more point. Okay. You know, I, I wondered how long it would take for somebody to call that like God. Okay, Eric. You know, we've got a plan. We've either got a God, or we got a universe that evolved from just a, a, a random process. I don't think either one tried. But it's really hard to get through the idea that there's a third way. There's a possible different way. We don't even know where we exist in this universe, whether we are re really can see the beginning of it, or if we only see the beginning of one little millionth of it. We don't know. And we make a lot of assumptions on that. So. Okay. All right. Good All right. Night. Let's thank you. Let's over. thank our speaker again one more time. Right. Well, Little and Will, Frank, you just don't see it. Yeah, you I don't see it. I guess. Okay. Okay.